Good evening, everyone. We are very happy to welcome you all to the 23rd lecture of the Distinguished Lecture Series organized by the Department of English, Jamia Melia Islamia. Today, we have the honor of hosting Professor Denise Ferreira de Silva. She's Professor and Director of the Institute for Gender, Race, Sexuality, and Social Justice at the University of British Columbia, Vancouver, and a visiting professor at the School of Law at Warwick, University of London, who is here to deliver the talk, Unpayable Debt. We will be recording today's lecture, and at the same time, it's being live streamed for our audiences and subscribers on YouTube. There will be a question and answer session at the end of Professor De Silva's talk, and all of you are requested to kindly post your questions in the chat box, which will be then addressed to Professor Ferreira De Silva. This lecture series is being organized under the guidance of our head of the department, Professor Simi Malotra. I request her to kindly deliver the welcome address and introduce Professor De Silva to us. Thank you so much, uh, Suman. That's, thank you so much. Uh, Professor Denise Ferreira da Silva, our invited speaker this evening, and all others who have joined us, I, on behalf of the Department of English, Jamia Millia Islamia, extend a very warm welcome to all of you to this distinguished lecture series. Friends, this is the 23rd lecture of our series, and we're indeed lucky and deeply privileged to have with us Professor Denise Ferreira da Silva, one of the leading voices of our times, as our distinguished speaker this evening. It is an honor and privilege for us to host Professor da Silva, and we are all waiting to hear her speak on unpayable debt. I'm extremely grateful to you, Professor da Silva, for agreeing to share your time and your scholarship with us this evening. I cannot thank you enough for agreeing to be a part of our series and we are really looking forward to it. I welcome you and now it is my honor and privilege to introduce Professor De Silva formally, though she needs no introduction whatsoever. Uh, Denise Ferreira De Silva is Professor and Director of the Institute for Gender, Race, Sexuality and Social Justice at the University of British Columbia, Vancouver. She's also a visiting professor at the School of Law at Birkbeck University of London. As an academic and practicing artist, through her works, she addresses the ethical political challenges of the global present. She's the author of Towards a Global Idea of Race, 2007, Unpayable Debt, 2021. She's co editor of Race Empire and the Crisis of the Subprime, published in 2013, the principal editor for the Rutledge Cavendish book series, Law, Race, and the Post Colonial. Her articles have been published in leading interdisciplinary journals such as Social Text, Theory, Culture, and Society, Social Identities, Philosophia, Griffith Law Review, Theory and Event, The Black Scholar, to name just a few. Her writings have also been translated into several languages, including Portuguese, Spanish, Italian, French, German, Swedish, Danish, and many more. Her artistic works include the films Serpent Rain, 2016, and For What Is Deep Implicancy 2018 in collaboration with Arjuna Newman, and the relational art practices, poetic, poeti poetical readings, and sensing salon in col collaboration with Valentina Desideri. She's exhibited and lectured at major art venues such as the Pompidou Center in Paris, Whitechapel Gallery in London, MASP Sao Paulo, Guggenheim in New York, New York and MoMA in New York. She's also written for publications for major art events for, from Liverpool Biennale to San Paolo Biennale to Venice Biennale and Documenta 14, and featured in art publishing venues such as Canadian Art, Text of Kunst, and EFLUX. Her research areas include critical racial and ethnic studies, feminist theory, critical legal theory, political theory, moral philosophy, uh, post-colonial studies, and Latin American and Caribbean studies. Her theoretical work, which is informed by research on themes such as female genital cutting, police brutality, and Black political mobilization, and the rhetoric of the war on terror, consists primarily in the formulation of a critical strategy, global historical analysis, which highlights the centrality of raciality in modern post-enlightenment thought. Drawing from post-structural and feminist theory and psychoanalysis, it is offered as a critique of liberal and contemporary critical theorizing, as it seeks to capture how raciality as a scientific signifier of human difference, which institutes globality as an ontological horizon, operates in the present global configuration. And in doing so, it seeks to open up new avenues for theorizing global justice. This concern results not only from her interdisciplinary training, but also from many years of political activism in the working, working class neighborhood associations in Rio de Janeiro and in the Black Brazilian movement. 
In her most recent work, Unpayable Debt, she examines the relationship among coloniality, raciality, and global capital from a Black feminist poetic, poetical perspective, focusing on the philosophy behind value. Professor De Silva exposes capital as the juridical architecture and ethical grammar of the world. Here, raciality as a symbol of uh, coloniality justifies deployment of total violence to enable expropriation and land extraction. Professor Denise uh, Ferreira da Silva is also a member of several boards, including uh, International Consortium for Cr Critical Theory Programs, uh, House de Kulturen de Welt in Berlin, and the journals Postmodern Culture, Social Identities, and Dark Matter. Two, her, two of her upcoming books are Law, Race, and the Postcolonial, a Handbook, and Indigenous Peoples and the Law, a Handbook. We're so, so grateful to you, Professor Dennis, uh, Professor Fred De Silva, for being with, here with us. And we're so looking forward to this talk. Deeply honored and over to you, Professor Dennis. Thank you so much, Professor Simi Malotra, for this very kind uh, introduction and actually humbly introduction. And also to everyone uh, who's been involved in the organization of the, the lectures and in my invitation, Suman and Zara and, uh, and everyone. Um, I'm really happy to be here talking to you, though I would like to be there <laughs> somewhere <laughs> in physical space, but it's an honor, uh, the privilege to be part of this distinguished lecture series. Um, I What I have prepared for today is, is in a way an introduction to the argument that I elaborate in my latest book, Unpayable Debt. So it's not a conventional lecture, it's more the assembling of an image or maybe a version of the assembling of the image of Unpayable Debt. And some of it I take from, from the book itself and some of it, most of it will be more of a context and then further elaborations of, of the image of Unpayable Debt. Um, now, I uh, let me let me just move something around here. Okay, um, I'm going to begin with a, with a long quote from uh, Octavia Butler's um, *Kindred*. I closed my eyes, remembering the big man, hearing again his advice to Nigel on how to defy the whites. I had caught up with him. Do you think the trader took him all the way to New Orleans? I asked. Yeah, he was getting a load together to ship them down there. I shook my head, poor Luke. Are there canned fields in Louisiana now? Canned cotton rice, they grow plenty down there. My father's parents worked in the cane fields there before they went to California. Luke could be a relative of mine. Just make sure don't wind up like him. I haven't done anything. Don't go teaching nobody else to read. Oh, yeah, it's oh. I might not be able to stop that if he decides he decided to sell you. Sell me? He doesn't own me. Not even by the law here. He doesn't have any paper saying he owns me. Then I don't be don't talk stupid. But in town once I heard a man. Brag how he and his friend had caught a free black, tore his papers, and sold him to a trader. I said nothing. He was right, of course. I had no rights, not even any papers to be torn up. Just be careful, he said quietly. I nodded. I thought I could escape from Maryland if I had to. I didn't think it would be easy, but I thought I could do it. On the other hand, I didn't see how even someone much wiser than I was in the ways, much more than, much wiser than I was in the ways of the time could escape from Louisiana, surrounded as they would be by water and slave states. I would have to be careful, all right, and be ready to run if I seemed to be in any danger of being sold." End quote. Any paper saying he owns me, she retorts, as if papers were enough to prove or disprove Rufus' father's right to trade her. No papers, papers. It would not matter because then there, where Dana and Rufus meet and converse, 
their positions established by his authority and not a, by a given hierarchy. Their positions are given by the color of their skins. He owns her, even if, as it turned out, Rufus and his father were her ancestors. But if she had papers, would use what we use would they have if Rufus or his father or, or any white person then there decided to punish her to use the lash? Because it is not only that she could be sold even though even without papers showing that they owned her, Rufus and his father could beat her as they did. And yet they did need papers, even if false ones. They knew that, and so did Dana and their slaves. They needed papers to prove that an enslaved person, body and mind, was to be expended however they, slave owners, wanted. The title assured this as a legal right, that is, assured their authority to make decisions about how to expand the enslaved person and whether they were to live or die. That's why she said nothing. Existing as a Black person then, there, she knew that having not even paper to torn up renders her nothing before the law and customs of mid 1830s Maryland. Why should it matter if Dana had papers or not, if she could read or not, even if she could teach someone to read? What's at stake? With her papers in hand, she could do so many things. She could migrate up north and be sure not to be found near a farm or field again. She could decide and stay to find a, to find a free companion and try to make do as others tried. She could even decide to sell her labor to the whalings. Why it did matter is precisely because papers would place Dana in a position that was not acceptable back then over there. Papers, of course, were not enough. Papers could be as they were torn up. The freed woman or men, women or men, could then be sold by anyone, white person that is, that would claim and show proof that they own them. Having no papers made no difference there, where when existing as a black person meant that one's person, body, mind could be claimed by anyone who looked like they could own her. Legally, as it was to become the law of the land about two decades from when Dana found herself, having been a slave and rendered a black person forever subjected to being returned to the position of the captive. A position without ethical significance in a moment when liberty and equality emerged as attributes of humanity and descriptors of the human, which was also when the initial elements that would enter in the confection of the analytics of raciality were being assembled. Nevertheless, even on that juridical position without ethical significance, the captivity of the laboring body could be proved, ascertained, and secured, but of her mind, as Dana learned all too well, and Luke seems to have paid a high price for it, of her mind, of that no one would ever be certain, the captivity of her mind, of that no one would ever be certain, not in the market, not in the fields, even as her body mind are expanded in the movements, the gestures, in everything needed to turn soil, water, the horse or the plow into cotton balls. No one, not then there, not here now, would ever know not the songs she chanted to ease the burden, the force, the expropriated labor under the summer sun or, or the winter snow. None of that attest that the owner successfully enslaved her mind. And that Dana knew. That had everything to do with not allowing slaves to learn how to read. That had everything to do with that moment in time when a person's value was attached to her mind, when she knew what, or what she knew and what guided her as she go, what guides her as she goes about existing day to day. And she also learned while back then there that when a black person appears to try and express such value, the lash is released with all its might. Not even by the law, Dana says, but she knows that it did not and still does not matter 
whatever the law protects, whatever falls under the mode of equalize of, of under that mode of equalizing, does not include a black person. But then that meant Dana learns in her last encounter with Rufus is that title, the paper attesting the owner's authority to dispose of the slave. Title was the only paper that matter, mattered. That paper is the only one recognized by the juridical, the state and the court structures. And that force then followed, that force followed Dana back in her last return home when she lost a part of her arm caught in the wall. Thinking with that wall and the injury it holds opens up a venue for reading the political architecture of the global present as the workings of the colonial racial, juridical, the state and capital. A reading guided not by a question that drives the examination of causality, seeking determination, or the attribution of a purpose aiming at interpretation, because these tools of the transparent eye in the guise of the known subject cannot but keep Dennis' predicament subjected to his limited and limiting means for comprehension. Beginning with Dennis' wounded body, with that which attests to both the owner's authority and to the occurrence of the scene of total violence, the scene of which killing and or raping is the goal. Keeping this, this, this reading immediately locates the encounter in the political context. That is, that will, it would, it to its juridical economic symbolic, um, it attends, sorry, to its juridical economic symbolic and ethical conditions. When doing so, by addressing the slave in the scene of total violence, where she troubles the separation between human and thing, this reading exposes the transparent eye in the guise of the ethical subject. It at work in the impossibility of addressing how the colonial and racial work in as global capital. For the Negro, insofar as it is a common name for property, a thing in the economic scene of value, did not count under anything that it's deemed unique to the human, which is considered solely under morality and the ethical scene of value. However, that total violence is deployed to assure compliance. The slave, insofar as she is a human being, is not like any other property. That is, she is a commercial thing, but neither a natural nor an artificial one. Everything, any other existing thing would fall under the natural or the artificial, and as such not be contemplated by the principles of humanity, named liberty and equality. But it is precisely this ambiguity, her being a human, that figures fungibility instead of dignity, that makes it thinkable the possibility that then there, as here and now, however, there was no question that just as the horses, the soil, the rainwater, and the sun rays, the body of the slave, as well as her mind, transduced into cotton, the sugar cane, and of any other commodity her labor brought into existence as such. So that was from the from the book. Now I, I proceed to talk about the, the image itself um, and how it comes about. So in view about that, the phrase uh, which gives the title to this book from which I just read, Unpeable that is a translation, uh, an in, the English translation of one of the most repeated slogans in Brazil in the so-called last decade, the 1980s. We chanted it in the streets as we protested against the military dictatorship and against the International Monetary Fund uh, structural adjustment policies. Um, about that foreign debt, that those policies were supposedly making us a Brazil may able to pay. About that, we, we chanted, this debt is unpayable. So when Paula Chakravarti and I were drafting the introduction to the American court on the special issue on race, empire, and the crisis of the subprime, which was about 10 years ago now, I would not but um, bring out this this term. As you recall, at the moment in the, in the, during the subprime crisis, mostly Black and Latinx persons, um, which, you know, 
what should become be blamed for the global crisis that um, uh, followed. They were also the most affected by the foreclosures that took, took place. They paid the highest prices, the loss of home and, and employment for a crisis caused by those who speculated on, who extracted value from their economic dispossession and their construction as improper economic subjects. When we were writing a couple of years into the crisis, some countries in Europe and elsewhere found themselves in the same position as Brazil and many other Latin American countries were in the 1980s. So that phrase, it came to me as an image that allowed, in fact, to combine these two sides, these two parts of um, that same crisis. We could say the two tail ends of that same crisis which was a situation that uh, Black folks and Latinx folks found themselves in the United States as uh, the, the Obama administration started the, the, the correcting, the addressing the economic crisis, but also the situation that some European countries found um, at a later date as the EU was um, trying to deal with the same problem. Um, so a few years actually after we were working on the, on the introduction in 2014, I had the chance to see that same, that same intuition uh, made sense, made even more sense. And in that, as I was invited to give a talk at one of the public programs of Documenta 14, which that year and that iteration was in uh, both uh, have been held both in Athens and in Kassel. Um, and I took that as an opportunity to expand on the speculations with Octavia Butler's characters, uh, character with Dana, that speculations that were included, in fact, in the, in the introduction to the American Quarterly Special Issue, but were not, you know, elaborated. They were just in uh, appeared in the introduction. And it so happens that iteration of, of Documenta was actually a response to the ways in which certain European countries, including Greece, were being treated in the same way as Black folks and Latinx folks had been treated in the US um, back in uh, 2008, 2009. So they were treated as improper uh, economic subjects and the acronym used to identify them was very telling. Uh, they were called pigs uh, in the countries of Portugal, Ireland, Greece, and, and Spain. Um, and, and I searched over the span of, of six years, at least, I, I had the chance of um, not only developed that, that image, but also of, unfortunately, in a way, finding it once again expressed in the global political political context. But anyway, so it's not really possible for me to cover all the many aspects that is that are relevant to the assemblage of, of, uh, of available that. So, but I have to say, as I said just before, that this presentation is itself uh, a montage. And it's, but in it, I'm speaking primarily in the ways in which, in this montage, I should say, in this version of the assembling, of the story of its assembling, I'm speaking primarily of uh, its importance in regards to racial subjugation. So I saw on Payable that is an image um, that I gathered in the task of capturing how Blackness as a symbolic tool, as a category of knowledge operates in the post-enlightenment political architecture, inspired by Walter, Walter Benjamin's dialectical image, the key to unpayable that is that it halts both the ruling sociological explanation for racial subjugation and the historical materialist account for capital accumulation. And, what, and it does so because it has the capacity to unravel two renderings of the scientific historic dialectic, 
the liberal sociological explanation for racial subjugation, the one that creates a recursive logical circuitry, and I call that explanation racial dialectic, and the Marxist explanation for economic exploitation, which only functions because of how the colonial conquest and slavery figures in the classical version of historical materialism, the limitation of proper capitalist social relation but also of its delimitation uh, and also, sorry, of its delimitation of the characteristic and necessary ethic and juridical formations that obtains the proper capitalist economic subject um, and its crucial um, principles, which are liberty and, um, and property. So, when I first considered that image effect of unpayable debt in terms of house and home, its double economic and ethical significance, I obviously immediately thought of then of uh, Butler's main character in her novel, Kindred, but also of Dennis, uh, but primarily of Dennis, Dennis Charge, which is a predicament uh, that is to save the life of Rufus the child of a slave owner who is also her great, great, great grandfather. That obligation I found was perhaps the best rendering of a debt someone owns, but it's not hers to pay. Not hers to pay because it is not uh, her decision that a decision of hers that led to it, to be a descendant of a slave owner and to travel in time to save his life or to render the profitability of mortgage-based securities contingent on her lack of equity as happened to Black and Latinx uh, so subprime borrowers. However, it is owned by her because her Blackness signals both slavery and the lack of equity. More importantly, Dana's obligation that that which is a condition of possibility for her existence, one in which family and slavery are indistinguished but not indistinguishable, that that has its own violations, in particular of the separations of space and time. So in her instantaneous relocations from her house in 1976, Los Angeles to the farm in 1886, Maryland, each time to save the life of Rufus, each of these delocations is a traversion of that which sustained which is sustained by space-time delineations, namely the delineations of then and now, um, and she meets you know, her long dead ancestors, and the determinations of here and there, she saves the life of a long dead ancestor. That is Dana's fulfillment of her obligation violates the linearity that is at the basis of, of the ontological descriptors formality and efficacy, and the ontopsomological pillars, separability, determinacy, and sequentiality of post-enlightenment thinking. For instance, uh, her, her fulfillment of her obligation breaks the rules of both sequentiality, the future operating in the past, and efficient causality, the cause becoming the condition of possibility for the, the effect. And for that, it is, uh, incomprehensible. Until, of course, one realizes how the violation did, her violations did not go unpunished. And in the last return trip to her Los Angeles home, Dana loses her arm, which was held by Rufus as he was dying after she struck him as he tried to rape her. So as I just mentioned before, the image effect of unpayable debt as a critical speculative rather than a determinative tool, its anti-dialogical force in a way, includes its capacity to unpack the prevailing account of racial subjugation, which I call the racial dialectic, which is a causal explanatory movement which takes the form of that closed logical circuitry, which now I explain further. In this logical circuitry, the bodily forms, racial difference, affect unbecoming mental traits, which on their turn affect juridical domination and economic dispossession, which are seen as unbecoming juridic and economic 
conditions in post-enlightenment uh, political architecture. Perhaps the great feat of the racial dialectic has been how effectively it renders the operation of the racial through racial and cultural difference irrelevant to the analysis of capital, even in this moment when the colonial infrastructures of extraction and the racial arsenal of signification play such a crucial role in support of the needs and interests of global state capital. So, and the, the, the remaining of this, of this montage, this, uh, this presentation of this montage, I, in, in, this, in, in what I'll speak now, <coughs> excuse me, I will, sorry, <coughs> I will focus primarily on these, on, on the juridic um, and economic corner of the political architecture and in how the image of unpayable debt allows us to dissolve the onto epistemological pillars that, you know, enable us to understand it. And in doing so, unpayable debt opens up for other ways of, of, of um, for other possible critiques of the, the global conditions. Um, so I'm choosing now, uh, uh, I'm mentioning now precisely this, this part in which uh, the Black, I'll comment now, sorry, in which Blackness functions in regards to the juridic moment of the post-enlightenment political architecture uh, and the ethical, uh, as I said. And what I'm, I'm going to highlight is how the unpayable that displaces the social structural operational meaning of racial hierarchy with a political confrontational emphasis on, on authority. Um, so yeah, I'm just taking it from the top. And in order to, to advance these, um, these, uh, the, this argument so to get started in this argument, I have a quote from uh, Frederick Douglass, 1881 text titled The Color Line. I quote, the slave master's interest in describing the black man as fit to slavery, discrediting the personality of those he held as proper, sorry, the slave master has an interest in describing the black man as fit to slavery, in discrediting the personality of those he held as property. Every man who had a thousand dollars invested had a thousand dollars, a thousand reasons for painting the black man as fit only for the slavery. The slave hold, the holders of twenty hundred million dollars worth of property in human chattels procured the means of influencing press, pulpit, and politician, and through these instrumentalities. They belittled our virtues and magnified our vices and have made us odious in the eyes of the world." End quote. Why so much has and yet nothing seems indeed to have changed in, regarding, in regards to the deployment of total violence against Black person between 1881 and 2021? Well, that's a question that will or 2022, <laughs> it will remain. Though following different procedures, what drives Frederick Douglass's argument in the color line is not that much different from what moves my own interest in the unraveling of the racial dialectic. And that is an elucidation of Blackness capacity to orchestrate the juridic moment of the post-enlightenment um, political uh, uh, architecture. Not surprisingly, like Douglas, I too choose to confront the symbolic moment when considering Blackness in political terms, that is, as a referent of subjugation. So what, what Douglas gives us, or at least what he gives me. Um, unwilling to accept the argument that race prejudice is universal, a natural, instinctive human reaction to racial difference, Douglas advanced a logical argument against it. He began by logically dismounting this thesis through a consideration of seven points, which he would say, we, with which we all agree, he would say. And he reached the only possible conclusion, which was that, I quote, out of the depth of slavery has come this prejudice and this color line, 
end quote. So for me, neither is Carlos Lyon the fact of a natural white mental, moral, intellectual attribute, nor is racial difference expressive of black person's mental, moral attributes. That's his argument. For him, is that once the undesirable conditions that coupled with color black, once they disappear, and those undesirable conditions were economic conditions, there were there will be no color lines to be to be drawn. So, and then in doing so, he offers a, a description of the color line that renders blackness a condensation of juridical and economic components of the colonial political architecture in in the US, but that could be extended to the whole of the Americas. But the argument that uh, Douglas, to which Douglas was responding, was the one that became prevalent and it is at the core of, of uh, the prevailing explanation for racial subjugation, which was the one that presented outline as a figure for segregation and the Jim Crow, but it's also the one that prevents the color line as uh, in reference to blackness as a badge of inferiority of slavery and, uh, and servitude, and also as the cause of a feeling of inferior, inferiority um, that would prevail among, among black persons. And those, those were uh, the, the main arguments for uh, bringing about racial equality. And, and these arguments can be found both in the early sociology of race relations in the beginning of the 20th century and uh, in that of the middle of the 20, the, also the 20th century, and even in the prevailing explanation that we find now in most sociology books. So evidently, because when the color line is presented as a badge or a cause of a feeling, it fits perfectly with what I call the interpretive epistem that prevailed uh, throughout the 20th century. And it can, and it is reconstructed in psychological, anthropological, but also in, in, in literary terms. But these, these set of interpretations cannot capture uh, what's crucial in Douglas' description, which is exactly a process of transformation of those of, of certain components in which in the post-emancipation era, blackness seems to afford anyone or any institution that is not named, identified, constructed as black, afford them the juridical authority with that, that authority one, which uh, the owner had at the same time um, to deploy total violence onto black uh, persons. So in doing this and describing this transformation, Douglas is rendering of um, the color line is perhaps the earliest announcement of something I call the racial event, which is a form of the scene of subjugation, the one which uh, the racial dialectic cannot capture because um, it renders racial subjugation only uh, an effect of these symbolic uh, operators. So for this reason, I, I found that a shift in thinking is needed to capture the full significance of Douglas' challenge to the explanation that prevailed in 1881, but also it still seems to prevail in 2022. And that shift in thinking is what, that which I'm turning uh, now. And this has to do obviously with uh, the incomprehensibility of Dan Dana's charge of her having to go back in time to save the life of an ancestor that could kill her in any moment. And this has to do with uh, the distinction between the probable and the possible. And let's go moving to that distinction. Um, and that also, I think, gives uh, also the sense of the, the philosophical level of this, of this intervention, because without this philosophical level, it wouldn't make much sense. But so if the probable and the possible, uh, if they belong to different registers, so if I would use the, the Kantian language, if one belongs to the understanding and the other uh, to the imagination, respectively, so what's real as opposed to what's uh, imagined and what's true 
do not need to coincide. Hallucinations, daydreams, dreams in general may be included content, may include content, sorry, that it's true in terms of whether or not they are, there is evidence for it to be so, but not real. If one defines reality in terms of uh, the actual space-time existence of a thing and its actual existence is between quotes. Though in both cases is a matter of judgment, actually of three different statements, um, they are not necessarily of the same kind or better. In the post-enlightenment extreme, they do not operate at the same level. For what is and what is not probable or the attribution of truth refers to the validity of the statement. The statement on whether something is possible as opposed to impossible refer, refers to the form of the statement. And the statement regarding reality refers to the thing being judged. So what makes Dennis charge thinkable and comprehensible is precisely what makes it probable. The fact to be confirmed by find for by her by finding the last name out of the last name of her great great grandmother, um, whether or not Rufus was her ancestor. Now this is given by the last name, uh, an index of a juridic relation, because then as the descendant of slaves, it, it is of two possible such relations in antebellum US, a relation of property title and marriage, a family relation. Similarly, Dennis Blackness enjoys the same validity if we recall that like Brad Scott, which this has to do with the case, the case that um, was crucial in asserting Blackness as a symbol of being somebody's prop property. So like, and I can talk more about Brad Scott later if you'd like to, but like the Red Scott with or without papers proving her status as a free black woman, should still be submitted to the authority of any white person if caught without Rufus protection or out of his land. So moreover, it extends beyond slavery as a, as a racial event materialized in the many cases of materialized as a racial event as materialized in the many cases of police shootings of unarmed black persons and, when, uh, and prosecutors failure to charge and also in the racial dialectic that supports court's consistent failure to deliver guilty verdicts in such cases. Now, how blackness has come to acquire the same validity as last names and title papers having establishing a juridical relation, that is due to its construction as a scientific category. So what needs further consideration is how it is related to also to how for centuries now, black skin color indexes the juridical position of, of the slave. So here I'm connecting the symbolic, the political symbolic term, blackness, the juridic, the economic, and then of course, the, the juridical, the economic, and, um, and the ethical is underlying all of this for now. So almost two decades after the abolition of, uh, of slavery, commenting on precisely that point in that text that I, I just mentioned, Douglas, Frederick Douglas presents a case for how black persons' juridical and economic conditions um, had shown how slavery had extended into, into the 1880s. Employing that large procedure, his argument against the sense of man's explanation of this prejudice as an effect of physical differences Douglas is precisely uh, challenging how this racial difference had been deployed as the cause for the post-emancipation US conditions that maintained black, the black population in de facto economic dispossession, a situation that differed little from how they lived under the regime of slavery. But the same modern symbolic scientific constructions of racial difference that Douglas is um, challenge, they, they were redeployed by the sociology of racial relations and they are crucial and it's uh, racial, racial dialectic, but they did so without uh, some of the determinative statements. 
So the argument here is um, because I'm I'm skip, skipping some things because I, I I do want to leave some time for us to talk. Um, is that uh, the political symbolic role of, of raciality, um, it, of racial difference, sorry, remains in, in the sociological um, explanations, as I said, as I, as I said, as I said before, actually, as I mine. But anyway, let me conclude by identifying some few in, invisible threats that I hope will bring this all together in some way. I know this is a speculative uh, puzzle, but it's been designed to be this way. Um, because if I were to write it straight, it would not uh, have the force that available that is. Um, so I'll do it by commenting more on the main thread, thread which is the figure of unpayable debt itself. And I just remind again that it's, it is not a concept and it's not an analytical tool, though this, it does the work of both. It is an image which which is in itself contradictory because it acknowledges that something is owned, owed, a debt, but it states that it cannot be paid. And not as one would expect that the, the one who owes cannot pay or should not pay, pay. So there is a challenge of the legitimacy of the conditions that led to the existence of the debt, the conditions that forced the obligation upon the one who owes. There is no, not, no challenge challenge of the debt itself. It, it is as if I say, yes, I owe you. I was forced to carry this obligation. So this takes us to the second thread, which has to do with the forced nature of the debt. Now, the emphasis on force refers to two moments, the juridic and the economic, in regards to slavery and also the authorized violence that characterized it. And authorized in the sense that the slave owner, because an owner could dispose of the enslaved body had right, the legal right to employ physical violence in order to force the slave into spend, expand her body working in the fields, the kitchen, or the market square. This is what I call the juridic moment. And evidently, this is also the economic moment as the deployment of total violence with all this perversity had a main objective, which was to expropriate the value produced by slave labor whether directly through torture of a person or indirectly by using someone else's as a, an example, as a reminder to any enslaved person who might be inclined to display of refusal, just to show them who had uh, the power. The other important thread has to do with what I call the ethical moment, which is perhaps the most perverse because it is precisely the fact that the explanation for racial subjugation uh, the racial dialectic, it belongs to that moment. Um, and that also renders the very explanation an efficient tool for racial subjugation. This is a, the more, more complex part of the argument that I made in my book toward the global idea of race. And But what's important in this context is that unpayable that breaks the circuitry, the vicious cycle that racial difference explain why black and non-white populations find themselves under conditions of juridic domination, high rates of incarceration, uh, also through being killed by the police while walking in the streets and economic dispossession. And on people that breaks this logic by recalling precisely how under colonial domination and later under racial subjugation, the main operative ele elements in racial subjugation are of the order of the juridic and the economic not the ethical. Actually, the ethical force of racial difference results precisely from how it clouds the juridic economic mechanisms of subjugation at work. So what Unpayable that exposes is how racial subjugation, as referenced by Blackness, involves all moments of the political, the juridic, economic, ethical, and symbolic. And it does so by foregrounding the connection between the ethic and the economic. And this realization, I find, I find, is a first step towards thinking the world, a uh, thinking of the world that welcomes existence without the premise of violence and without valuing, necessitating so much of extraction. Okay, uh, thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you so much, Professor De Silva. That was such an important talk and such a valuable talk for us. I mean, what you say about unpayable debt. 
uh, and about, of course, the condition of unpayable debt in your own context is something which also talks so much to us where we are located in some senses. So, of course, it does offer a critique of a global condition, but also of our histories and of our presence in some ways. And such important interventions and you know moments of clarity with which you spoke about truth and about uh, the real. And that's that's something which is so relevant to our times more in 2022 than in any other time. And thank you so much that, I mean, even though you say that it's an image and it's a critical, it's not a critical tool, but I think unpayable debt as a category does allow us to be able to think of the things from our own context and locations as well. But thank you so much, Professor De Silva. I don't want to stand between you and the questions. And so I'm going to invite my dear friend and colleague, uh, Susan, to take on the next session ahead. Yeah. So she will be posing the questions to you. Over to you, Susan. Thank you, Professor Malhotra. And thank you again, uh, Professor Ferreira De Silva. That was a wonderful, wonderful talk. Um, if you allow me, I'll start with the questions that we've received. Yes. Yes, sir. Okay. Um, so the, I'm reading out the very first question. Uh, dear Professor Ferreira de Silva, thank you for this wonderful talk. As you were talking about the financial crisis of 2008 in your work, Unbeable Debt, I was thinking of how we may connect this to the recent, or in fact, if I may, current global health crisis. Um, okay, that's the question. Excellent. Yes. yes. <laughs> okay. Thank. Thank you. Thank you for reading. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Yes, I have been thinking about it for a for a while actually. I mean, since during the crisis, and trying to to make sense of how we could speak about the fact of how, for instance. Um, the majority of those, uh, I mean, the, the, a large, larger percentage of, of uh, non-white folks in the U.S., in Canada, in the U.K., were uh, more in, uh, had more, you know, were more infected to um, by uh, the COVID uh, for the, the SARS-CoV-2, and uh, and were hospitalized, and and we know why, right? Because of well, essential workers, employment conditions. Well, Populations of we're talking about uh, populations of color, but but also of immigrant populations, especially talking about the UK and and Canada, uh, health conditions which have to do with accumulation of stress and and expropriation, so diabetes and other comorbidities, and housing conditions. So we we knew that even before uh, even before the the official announcement of the pandemic on March 17. 2020, the Imperial College document on the uh, the pandemic that was the guide was to serve the guide for all governments in the world to decide to suppress or mitigate the virus. They already said that people of color would be the most affected, right? So on the one hand, we have this we we have what we know that that governments would decide not to suppress because they knew that. But the last not let us not be paranoid. More importantly, we have that the social indexes that gave the that gave the, the numbers of, of infections and that also explained those curves and models of those projections, those social indexes, they result of the accumulation of extraction and expropriation. Right, and we and we know that, and we now also know that because they were results of previous political decisions that were made in terms of where, of the management of populations, whether the populations are former slaves or immigrants from from the former colonies. On the one hand, and then you know, on the other hand, in the global south, we knew that once that virus were to hit countries in the global south. The, the I call it the negative accumulation, <laughs> the negative accumulation that is is inscribed in the social space in those social spaces in the in the economic infrastructure would also result in more. So yeah, when people that has a lot to do with that because to me it is one image, one one image that allows to and then just you know commenting on Simi's um commentary. Thank you for for the commentary on, on my talk. The, about that, there is an image that to me, it just breaks open something 
And there are no connections that would not otherwise be made between global economic crisis, how they affect India, how they affect Brazil, and how they affect you know, Latinx immigrant folks living in a neighborhood in Los Angeles, right? And, it, and the racial logic is the same. And the colonial, the colonial conditions of possibility are the same. Um, so to me, it does that. And then we, <laughs> um, I call it throwing black light. <laughs> Right. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Um, right. Um, I'll move on to the next question. Uh, this is um, a little general, but I think um, that may be a good kickstarter. Uh, Professor Ferreira de Silva, many thanks to you for your time in this lecture. Uh, what are your thoughts on the correlation between raciality, coloniality, and global capitalism and its operation within the digital space today? Okay. Yeah, that's a question that I'm going to take at least 20 minutes if I were to try to, to bring the, play, uh, the place together. Uh, it's, it, it, is a, it is a difficult one, isn't it? Because on the one hand, we can, when we talk about the digital, the digital context, I'm thinking now primarily about um, social media, Right. It is easier also because of the nature of the visual sound, whatever the nature of the, 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 the to look at explicit statements uh, or to look at imagery, uh, coded or uncoded imagery of, of, to talk about racial exclusion or misrepresentation of racism and stereotypes, et cetera, right? Uh, explicit language, implicit language, we can talk about it. Now, and uh, and we know because the, the you know raciality is about the political symbolic moment of of post enlightenment domination and this and representation as we, we know is, is very crucial in in that. But I prefer to think more in terms of the conditions of possibility for the digital space, which is a digital infra, um, the infrastructure, you know, the electronic infrastructure. Um, the computers, the, 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 the fiber optics, um, the, the energy sources in the batteries. So I'm more interested in, in, um, in how, for instance, coloniality as a mode of governance is still very much at work, whether in Chile, in the lithium mines um, that are again, rendering Chile, not, again, a, a, a site of extraction. I mean, always continuing, but a site for the extraction of a new, material, a new mineral for supporting our lives now. And then at the same time, thinking about Congo DRC, where the ongoing total violence that began when King Leopold claimed the lands and continues now allowing for the extraction of copper that also comes into making possible this, um, this, this infrastructure. So here we see on the one hand, coloniality as a mode of governance through total violence that allows for the extraction while you know, the population is being decimated and raciality as a political symbolic arsenal that explains the violence in the Congo as if is something about Congolese people and African people being unable to build a democracy because they're black, because they don't contemplate, understand, or Africans, they don't understand the principles necessary for a democracy. While in fact, this global capital that continuously um, deploys total violence to make you know, the, the materials available. So, uh, so coloniality and raciality provide the material conditions of possibility for our digital existence. When we come to attend to what is said, what's done, it's like it's violence double. It's you know it's doubled, tripled. It's violence on top of it's, it's symbolic violence on top of total violence of juridic violence, uh, attending to economic needs. Um, thank you, thank you so much, Professor. So the next question uh, is from Anand, um, and I'm reading the question. I found the references to Butler's kindred throughout your talk fascinating, since I find that your own reading of colonial, colonial, coloniality and raciality is akin to the writer's journey from the book, especially with reference to time and ethics. 
could you tell us what led you to Kindred and what it means to read Kindred today with our experiences of the pandemic and so on? That's the question. Without the experience of what? Sorry, I missed pandemic, the last... pandemic, the COVID-19 pandemic. Ah, with the, with the with the pandemic. So I don't know. I should I should go back and read read Kindred again because I, <laughs> I started reading Kindred back in the um, Wise in the Nineties. It's oh my God! It's like almost almost thirty years ago, and I remember when I I discovered Octavia Butler's um, work when I was in, in doing my PhD in the U.S. and I, I took a I took a black feminist course in uh, with a professor in literature, and then I loved I always loved science fiction, and then like I looked for a black science fiction writer. I found Octavia Butler. I fell in love with the characters, and I read everything I could until you know I think I have read everything that's been that's been published. And for me, um, as so in a way, Kindred and 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 the and the and and, and, Anu and Dawn and all the other characters, they they were part, they came together in my it's a difficult thing. So how do I say I think with science fiction? The same way I think with quantum physics, right? I I it's it's my philosophical, my philosophical orientation. So for me, um Reading Kindred back 30 years ago as reading, reading it again when I was finishing the, the book back two years ago, and I did it during the pandemic. I, I, I wrote the finished the book in, in 2020. To me was was again like something that actually I derived from from the from reading and what the book is all about, which is precisely um the inseparability between then, there, and, and here now. And that inseparability is not only because of the ways in which raciality, in a way, gives continuity to the violence of coloniality, you know, it, while at the same time operating along with the new mechanisms of coloniality, but also is this uh, descriptor for existence that I, uh, I derive from, I, from um quantum field theory which is entanglement i call it deep implicacy and that when so the possibility for me is if i mean let me just say and i know i'm not answering the question because i can't answer that question <laughs> um to me it is as if um dana dana she never moved out of her house you know um because that the wall, everything was in the wall. So when her arm was caught in the wall, that's that's it. Um, and the possibility of thinking along those lines, of thinking um, transformation without movement in time or in space, to me is crucial if we are to acknowledge that we are actually, we are all in this together, but this is the planet. And what we are all in all together is all this violence that it's now defining the, our lives in on the on the planet over and about us. I'm talking primarily about those of us who are not white people, <laughs> um, but not only because white folks are also in, involved and also part of of this circumstance. And also, and it, it is also global warming and its effects. I think if we can't if we can't think without separability, we, if we can't think the ways in which we are all participating in all of it, not, not only, not in terms of how we identify ourselves, because those differences are always there, they are there, but in terms as we, as we exist materially, um, I don't think we will be able to, to get out of this planetary catastrophe. Um, so Kindred reminds me of that, that that house is everywhere. Uh, that wall is uh, Brazil, India, the US, Canada, um, the, you know, yeah. Thank you, thank you, Professor. We have exceeded the time, but if you will allow me, I'll pose one more question that we've received, is that okay? Yeah, it's okay. fine. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. This question is from Ashley. 
um, and Ashley writes, Professor Ferreira da Silva, in your opinion, what is the role of complicity in this, which seems like an essentialist conception of debt? An essentialist conception of? Debt. Fate? Fate. Debt. Unfair debt. Ah, that, essentialist. Um, okay, that's interesting. Um, it is not, okay, I would be, essentialist gives the sense of that is something that, 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 that is something which is an essence that it's shared by everything, but this is still very abstract. So the conception of that that I have in mind is very, uh, it's, it's material in the sense that, uh, for instance, when, um, you know, indigenous peoples claim to the land, to, to, for their land, for instance, they're based in a, in a relationship with the land that it's not only, and then also Black folks claims to uh, African ancestrality, they're based on a, on a relationship, or, or, or Black folks and you know, Caribbean and African nations claims to reparations. They're not based on, on, the, on an essence that it's there in the land, but, or, you know, sometimes, okay, we, you can, we can say that they are represented as such, but in my, in my reading, in my understanding, they are based on people that refer to the fact that in addition to everything else, to all these other ways in which those claims can be made, it's more crucial that the, you know, the cotton ball that was sent to England, you know, like beginning of the 19th century to be made into cloth, the work of picking, in, as slaves were picking that, that cotton, or when they were planting the, the, the cotton bush or the cotton the tree, they were expanding energy, they were expanding potential energy. That's called the labor, expanding one's body. Like it's uh, Marx, Marx describes labor exactly as that, as the material ex expenditure of the body. Now, we usually think of it as like, okay, that is that, and then that is what he says about value. But what, I, what I'm saying, the argument I make and I elaborated on, on the book, Unpayable That, is that that expenditure of potential energy that is labor and that exchange that goes on all the time, calor, which is uh, heat, that is materialized in the tree. So in the cotton tree, the cotton bush has the slaves, bodies, body energy, and also the water and the land and the animals it has them as matter, as as uh, as uh, elemental elementary particles, as protons, as electrons, as neutrons, as you know, photons. Uh, well, actually, photons not matter. It's like, but anyway, and it is at that level, and that has transduced into. That was that 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 energy transduced into the cotton that then was transformed into the yarn that was then transformed it transduced again into money, which is an abstract thing. Um, so it is not that we are. It's not that we are uh, the actualization of the same idea or principle, which would give essentialism, but that we are just recycled. Uh, that what now, you know, that my computer is very much recycled matter, recycled atoms and elementary particles that make it possible for me to talk to you. And then, and for that reason, I, I, I am also responsible for an unpayable debt because that cannot be paid. Uh, that is not monetized. Um, and that is us living as we do now um, materially. Thank you, thank you, Professor. One last question and I promise, I promise we'll Bye. stop if you allow. We're getting so many questions, is it okay? Yeah. Uh, so this question is from Dr. Karen Gabriel. Um, she writes, thank you for the nuanced and interesting talk. How, if at all, does the idea of unpayability open the possibility of repayment or not of accumulated and sometimes quantifiable debts. 
I'm thinking here about the ways in which ex colonies have computed loss under empire. Mm -hmm. oh, okay. um, so the question is about whether the payable debt supports claims for reparations. Uh, is that the, that's the question? I think so. Um, and uh, to me, what the, 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 the kind of thinking, but also the shift, because I was saying the shift is one is a philosophical one. So that is also a metaphysical of that moment there, right? That is, a, you know, if you think that the notion of the transcendental when, when Immanuel Kant presented it was to replace metaphysics and then hence is a metaphysical one, unpayable that is shifting, taking it from that, bringing down to the material, to the immanence, and that is a metaphysical shift. So that, such a metaphysical shift that would privilege, you know, material capacity, materiality, rather than abstract universals, it, I think, at least I, I, I think what drives me is, the view that such a shift would render decolonization the only possible um, actualization of justice and decolonization, uh, including reparations, right? Decolonization, not only the return, the restoration of the land, but also the restoration of the total value extracted from enslaved bodies um, and the restoration of, of the land. And also the total value extracted from what's been taken from from the land of colonized um, form of, of former uh, colonies. Um, but to me, it is also, because it's an unpayable debt, it is, um, it is the limit. It is the impossible limit that should force uh, the movement, you know, that drives the movement. So, uh, the, sense, so the idea is the sense of always doing less, right? Um, so, Returning everything is impossible because everything is what well, that of which we are made. So anything that is returned will always be less, but that's the obligation. Um, or maybe I should say, hence the obligation. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Ferreira de Silva. Very, very, Thank very you. grateful for your time yeah. and your patience. I will now uh, invite my colleague Zara for the official vote of thanks. Thanks, Susan. Good evening, everyone. It has been such a treat to listen to Professor D'Souza. And on behalf of the Department of English and the organizing team, I would like to thank everyone who made today's event successful. First and foremost, of course, a huge thanks to our speaker, Professor Da Silva, who's given us so much to reflect on. We will definitely be talking about this long after too. Thank you so much, Professor, for lending us so much of your time and for sharing your insights with us. We are indeed very grateful to you. As always, I would like to thank our HOD Professor Sini Malhotra. Thank you also to Suman, Susan, Aparna, and everyone on the organizing team who are responsible for running our events so smoothly. And thank you, our audience, who to everyone who tuned in today from diverse time zones and places. Thank you so much, friends, and we hope to see you all again very soon. Thank you so much. Thank, for the thank you so much, Professor De Silva. Please have a nice day ahead. Thank you so much. Really grateful. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.